hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatizing the fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnets, play, play, we urge you, only, seriously, to turn off your way now. Welcome back to the horror. Thanks for joining me this Saturday. We'll hear from The Witch's Tale this week. A series that debuted in May of 1931, aired until June of 1938. Produced 333 episodes for Mutual Stations. Also had a run in Australia for a time. Our story today is from December 7th, 1937. It's titled The Power of Lucifer. Witch's Tale. The Fascination of the Eerie. Weird, blood chilling tales told by old Nancy, the Witch of Salem, and Satan, her wise black cat. They are waiting. Waiting for you now. <laughs> A hundred and six year old I be today. Yes, sir. A hundred and six year old. <laughs> well, Satan. Give word to douse all lights and we'll get right down to business. That's right. Make it nice and dark and cheerful. We like gloom and shadow. Now, draw up to the fire and gaze into the embers. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see a crowded ballroom in a fine big house in New York City. And there, midst happiness and laughter, begins our tale about the power of Lucifer. <laughs> the power of Lucifer! <laughs> The next dance will be a waltz, dear. Sure you want to sit it out? Yes, Catherine. I've stepped on enough defenseless female toes this evening. And as I have to buy your shoes, I'll be economical as well as merciful. This balcony seems deserted. Let's go out there. And gaze at the moon? Mm-hmm. Now, here's an especially nice chair for moon gazing. Big enough for both of us. Not unless I sit in your lap. That's all right. I have a good, strong lap. Now, give me a kiss. <laughs> Warren, don't bust my hair. Oh, <laughs> Don't you ever get tired of making love to your wife? No. Nope. My wife ever get tired of having me make love to her? No. Nope. <laughs> there's no occasion for argument. Give me another kiss. <laughs> That's enough. And I'm going to sit in this other chair before you crush my gown and I press the crease out of your trousers. Uh, all evening you've forsaken me and now you're doing it again. I am. And unless you curb your romantic ardor, I'll make you take me back in there and dance. Uh, I'll be good. It's too nice to be out here with you and away from all those people. You don't like the crowd that's here, do you? Oh, they're all right, I suppose, but I don't understand them. I'm just a plain businessman. Hindu poets, Armenian artists, and Turkish musicians are way over my head. Since Mrs. Brewster decided to patronize the arts, she's certainly had some very strange people at her affairs. Strange? They seem lunatics to me. Fortunately, old Dr. Farmer's wife had deserted him, as you did me, so... He and I sneaked off in a corner and discussed politics, Wall Street, and baseball. <laughs> that plebeian brand of conversation soon drove away any nut who came near us. Uh, what particular sort of culture does the chap go in for who's been monopolizing you all evening? Mr. Orloff? Yeah, that's his name. I didn't catch it when we were introduced. He's a Russian, isn't he? I imagine so, though he didn't mention his nationality. What does he do for a living? I don't know. We spent enough time with him to have learned his whole life's history. <laughs> You weren't jealous? Of course not. I merely ask about him because, well, he's such a peculiar-looking chap, and 
I'm curious to know what there is about him that held your interest for so long. I don't know that either. He's a very strange person. He's talked the steady stream from the moment I met him. Yes, I, I know nothing about him at all. What did he talk about? Well, a subject that I've only heard of in the vaguest sort of way before. Devil worship. Devil worship? Yes. Not medieval witchcraft or anything like that. But something that exists today. The cult of Lucifer, he called it. Cult of Lucifer? It's a religious sect, he said, that has churches, ordained priests, and a ceremonial. And he said this cult of Lucifer is active now? Yes, all over the world. Right here in New York. He talks so much about it, I've an idea he himself's a member. I... Warren, there's something horrible about that man. Five minutes after I met him, he was absolutely repulsive to me. Yet you danced with him all evening. I don't know why. After the first dance, I wanted to get away. Yet, when he asked me for another, I... I I'd have been with him yet if you hadn't come for me. Warren, I made up my mind not to say anything about all this. It sounds so silly. Oh, I'm glad I've told you. I want you to stay with me for the rest of the evening. Don't leave me for a moment. And if Mr. Orlov asks me to dance with him again, you make some excuse. Don't let me. Catherine, are you intimating that you can't refuse this man yourself? Yes. Don't ask me why. I, I don't know. I'm afraid of that man, Warren. Terribly afraid. Oh, hello, Mrs. Brewster. My dear Catherine, we've been looking everywhere for you and Warren. Oh, just sitting out of dance, Mrs. Brewster. Won't you join us? Yes. Yeah. With them. Don't worry, darling. The honest are all off. Won't bother you now. You and your husband have been enjoying the moonlight, Mrs. Craig. Yes, Mr. Orloff. How gorgeously romantic. They're always running away from people so they can be by themselves, Mr. Orloff. As though they were sweethearts instead of husband and wife. In these two young people, you see the perfect marriage. A most unusual thing to see. Perfect things are rare. <laughs> I'll say they are. But you played me a mean trick when you disappeared with Catherine Warren. A Swedish poetess got me in the corner and nearly took my arm off. <laughs> I tell you, my dear, Dr. Farmer and I had organized a mutual protective association of two against art in there. <laughs> oh, you and the doctor are incurably bourgeoisie. <laughs> Afraid we are, Mrs. Brewster. Your guests of this evening are too highbrow for plain people such as Warren and myself. Uh, by that, I mean no offense to you, Mr. Wallace. None is taken. I, like you, am plain people. It's not what you call highbrow. <laughs> You're far too modest, Mr. Orloff. You and Warren must become better acquainted with this gentleman, Doctor. He's been everywhere, seen everything, and, oh, he's told me of the most interesting things. Catherine, my dear, did he tell you of that perfectly intriguing sect he calls the Cult of Lucifer? Yes, Mr. Orloff told me a great deal about it. Uh, what is the Cult of Lucifer? Simply a group, or rather many groups, of people who believe that evil is a more potent factor in this world than good. Consequently, they worship the Lord of evil and serve him, not by what orthodox religionists call worthy acts, but by bringing sorrow and trouble wherever they can. Did you ever hear of anything so perfectly fascinating? Uh, they're idiots in this world who go in for anything. The cult of Lucifer is not composed of idiots, Doctor. You may have heard it said that the devil takes care of his own. He endows his most ardent disciples with great power. So I am told. Oh, rot. Perhaps. Of course, I am only speaking hearsay. Oh, naturally. It's delightfully interesting to think about, but one wouldn't wish to be acquainted with people who believe such things personally, would one? I don't think so, Mrs. Bruce. Ah, no, darn well, I wouldn't. Now, I simply must return to my other guests. You'll excuse me, won't you? By all means, yes. You four lovely people mustn't stay out here too long, though. We've even been called. Well, no one gets me back in there. While I'm in my right senses, may I hope that Mrs. Craig will return to the ballroom very soon as my partner for the next dance, perhaps? I... I... Shall we go now? The music has begun. Yes. Catherine. I... I have your permission, of course, Mr. Wayne. Yes. Thank you. My arm, Mrs. Green. We shall join you gentlemen later. Warren, what's the matter with you? You look as though someone has hit you over the head. The doctor, what? That man made me say yes when I wanted to say no. He walked away with Catherine when I wanted to stop him and she didn't want to go. What are you talking about? By the Lord, he isn't going to get away with it. Warren, where are you going? Hold on. Hold on. Come back here. Hold on. Are you calling me, Mr. Bray? Yes, come back here, brother. 
Oh, you're, you're making a scene. What's the matter with you? You will soon find out, and so will he. Why have you called me, Mr. Gray? You know well enough. Step out here on this balcony and I'll tell you. Let go of his arm, Catherine, and come here to me. Warren. Come here to me. I... Go to your husband, Mrs. Gray. I... Yes. What kind of a game are you playing? She couldn't even take her hand from your arm until you let her. When she told me you'd made her dance with you all evening against her will, I, I didn't know what to think. But now I do, because you've just worked the same hypnotic trick on me. I don't like to be tricked, Mr. Roar. And I don't want hypnotists experimenting on my wife. She's not dancing with you anymore, that's all. Not quite all, Mr. Green. Your tone has been both loud and insulting. Dr. Farmer has been a witness. And others have been attracted by your word. It is your privilege to say I cannot dance with your wife. But I expect an apology. You won't get it all. It may be in my power to compel it. Not from me. Who will apologize to you, Mr. Gray, before these people? I... I apologize to you, Mr. Orloff. I thank you. But now that you have made it, I choose not to accept your apology, Mr. Gray. You will feel... That Ivan Orlov is a most vindictive man. Good night. What, a, what in heaven's name is the meaning of all this? What's happened to you? Again, you look stunned, like a man who has received the blow. Doc, he, he did it to me a second time. Beat down my will as he did before. It doesn't matter, dear. He's gone now. Let's get our things and leave here. We never met him before tonight. We won't see him anymore. I'm not so sure of that. I didn't like the look of that fellow when he left. He can't do us any harm, Doctor. He... He can't... can't... can't. Darling, what's the matter? Oh, Lord, dear. I... I feel faint. I... I catch you, Warren. She's falling. Catherine, darling. What's wrong with you? Doctor, she... She's fainted. Carry her to that bench. Lay her down. Yes. But what could have caused it? I don't know. Catherine... Catherine, darling. She's so white and still. She's scarcely breathing, Doctor. What's the reason for this? She hasn't been sick. I know that. I'm her doctor. Someone telephone for the ambulance. A uh, hurry. An ambulance, Doc. You, yes. you don't think... I've got to get her to a hospital if I hope to save her life. Her life? Yes. Her pulse is very weak. Her heart is beating and, and no more. But she can't die, Doc. You won't let her die. Not if I can help it. Hold on to yourself, my oh, boy. Catherine, Catherine. I can't understand it. I examined her only last week. Her heart was regular as a clock. What's the reason? Doctor, her lips are moving. She's trying to say something. What is it, dear? Oh, she hasn't even strength to speak to me. What's the reason? What's the reason? Be still, please. She is trying to say something. Catherine, what is it, dear? I couldn't hear her, Doc. What did she say? It was just a whisper. I think she said, the power of Lucifer. <laughs> Isn't she any better, Doctor? Just the same, my boy. That's all you've told me for three days, that she's just the same. And she lies on this bed, never moving, scarcely breathing, dying. Oh, isn't there anything you can do to save her? I've done everything, tried everything I know. I'm at my wit's end, boy. The specialist I've brought in can't diagnose this condition any better than I can, nor recommend the treatment. Uh, we doctors know so little. Then you haven't any hope. She's going to die? No, I haven't given up hope. But doctors are only men. Where we fail, often something else steps in and saves. God. He gives and he takes away, son. Everything in this universe is really up to him. And he's forgotten her and me. Don't you think I've prayed to him? Every moment since he collapsed that night, a prayer's been on my lips or crying in my heart. A prayer of desperation. A cry of my whole being. For if I lose her, I have nothing in the world. He's forgotten me. He doesn't care. I don't think you or I or any other human being can say that. For we don't know his scheme. My boy, 
I'm not just trying to deaden your anxiety and heartbreak with a sugar-coated anodin of religion. I haven't any creed. I'm just talking what I sincerely believe. Catherine has been unconscious for three days. She hasn't suffered for a single moment of that time or felt the slightest pain. If she doesn't come out of this, I don't say she won't. I don't believe she won't. And I'll do all a human being can to bring her back to you. But if I can't, she'll simply pass from a light sleep into a deep one. She'll have been spared a lot of trouble that living holds for everyone. God will have been very kind to her, my boy. And you won't have lost Catherine. For there's another place where those who love are reunited. Maybe. Three days ago, I thought that believed, was sure of it. Now I've lost all faith in the sort of providence that struck my wife without a warning. Warren. I've lost all faith, I tell you. If there is a force for good, there's an evil force that counteracts it. An evil force that's the strongest. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. Doctor, what did Catherine's whisper mean that night? When she murmured, the power of Lucifer. I don't know. Probably something about all of filthy cult had lingered in her mind. Or it may have been in my mind. So that I read her whisper as I did. I couldn't really swear her lips formed words. She murmured too low to hear. No, she said what you thought she did all right. She said the power of Lucifer. They were the last words she uttered. They were a message to me, a message I hadn't understood until now. Well, what do you mean? That devil all out did this thing to her. As he proved that he could bend our minds, now he's proved his hellish power in her body. You are mad. No, I'm not. You haven't any explanation for whatever struck her down without cause, without a warning. I have, at last. Olaf threatened me. He said the devil took care of his own. That he gave great power to his disciples, to him. That power is killing my wife. The power of Lucifer. The God of evil who is stronger than the Lord of good. You are beside yourself, my boy. You you can't believe such a thing. I do believe it. And if Catherine dies, then I'll know it's my true. My boy. Doctor. Catherine just moaned. The first sound she's made... Out of my way, Warren. Let me see. What's that rattling noise I hear? It's coming from her throat. Doctor. She looks different. She's lying so still there. There's not the slightest movement. Her eyes are open, staring. Doctor, why are you pulling that sheet over her face? Doctor! <laughs> Catherine! Catherine! Son, son. Catherine, my darling. Don't lose faith, my boy. You'll find her again if you don't lose your faith. Who is it? That's Oh, I, I shan't need you now. I've brought an important message, Doctor. It's to Mr. Gregg, from Mr. Orlop. Orlop? What is the message? Simply this slip of paper, his address, sir. But he said it was a matter of life and death. Oh, Doctor. Mrs. Gregg? Yes. His Just now. His address. A matter of life and death. Perhaps he meant he could have saved her. But this came too late. He'd gone and fathered and he thought. She's dead. Boy, what are you muttering to yourself? He killed her. He killed her. But this tells me where to find him. Warren. This tells me where to find him. Where to take his life for hers. Come back. Stop him, someone. He's mad, Doctor. All the power of Lucifer will save him. His life for hers. His life for hers. <laughs> Yes. 
You murderer. Wait. Before you press the trigger of that pistol, let me ask you one question. No, you... It is a question I summoned you to hear. The question of life or death. Do you want your wife restored to you? My... My wife? Do you want your wife restored to life? You know she's dead. That proves you killed her. I do not deny it. I told you once that Ivan Orloff was a most vindictive man. You fiend. Now you'll pay your life for her. Wait. First answer my question. Do you want your wife restored to life? Yeah. You're playing with me. A man does not play when another holds a loaded pistol at his breast. And I am very afraid of firearm, really. Keep your pistol, Mr. Gregg. Keep it pointed at my body, if you will. But you had better hear what I have to say before you shoot. I So, you relax a little. That is better. I left a note telling you where to find my humble residence, as your dear wife breathed her last. But wait. I left it because Ivan Orloff is also a forgiving man. When his vengeance is complete. And the power of Lucifer can give as well as take. The power of Lucifer. Which in that hospital room this evening, you'll realize was greater than the power of who? I am a priest of Lucifer. Is this the power that I wield? You doubt perhaps that I can bring your wife to life as I have made her die. Take this piece of paper. Tear it up. Tear it up. Hold the pieces in your open hand. I have not touched them. I do not touch them. Yet look. They, they've joined together. As they were before you tore them. So I can restore the broken fragments of your dear one's life. Give her back to me and I'll be your slave. I do not need a slave. But a master I adore. Need loyal servants. What do you mean? That the devil takes care of his own, but only his own. That he gives nothing for nothing. You must pay a price. That you must serve him if you would have him serve you. To, to regain Catherine, I must... You must be consecrated in my master's service. Tonight and forevermore, you must bow down and worship Lucifer. <laughs> Well, my brother, for we are brothers now by the virtue of the faith we share. <laughs> you did not enjoy your consecration in our order? It was horrible. Bestial. Unholy. Holy and unholy are words we do not employ. The king is either evil or unevil. For there our power lies. If evil gives you power to bring back the warmth of life to that cold body on the bed, I accept your awful faith. To have her back, to have her love again, is worth the eternal damnation of my soul, if I have a soul. You must not doubt the existence of your soul, my brother. For to accept the creed of evil, the creed of good must also be believed. One cannot exist without the other. Our deity is stronger, as you shall soon see. For he will bring the dead to life. How soon? How soon? In less than a minute. Blood will course again in those... Now so like the things, breath will, will return, and those closed eyes will open of themselves. In less than a minute, the dead will rise and walk. Oh, Catherine, it'll be worth my soul to have your love again. Ah, you have not forfeited your soul. Souls are not my master's business. You said if he restored her, I must pay a price. Of course. He gives nothing for nothing. What will that price be? I do not know. I do not even know the price that I must someday pay for power. But I do not care. Power is all that matters. And I shall live many years to wield it. For I control the minds of men. And nothing can destroy me. Or not. Colors returning to her cheeks. By the power of Lucifer. She breathed. You kept your promise. You're restoring her to life. Not I. But he, my sir. Her flesh grows warm. She's coming back to me. Now, like you, I don't care what price I have to pay. I'll have Catherine once more. My Catherine. All up. She's at her eyes. 
Speak to me, darling. Let me hear your voice again. You look as though you didn't know me. I'm Warren, dear. Your husband. <laughs> Ke Catherine. Why do you laugh like that? Why are you laughing like a like a baby? Olaf. Her eyes. What about them? They're blank, staring. Her body lives, but her eyes are dead. So they are. I forgot to tell you that though my master can restore the dead to life, he cannot restore the brain. You you mean that Catherine? <laughs> she is an imbecile, my brother. As I have said, the Lord of Evil has no province over souls. And without a soul, there can be no mind, of course. But rest easy now. You have nothing more to fear. You have paid the devil's price. You monster! You fiend! Drop that gun. Oh! You fool. I told you I had mastery over all created men. When I let you keep that gun this afternoon, I only played with you for amusement. I am a priest of Lucifer. With the power he has given me, I shall live forever. <laughs> Catherine! She has picked up the gun you dropped. Take it from her and return it to your pocket. It pleases me to have you keep it and know you cannot use it. <laughs> Imbecile! Do not point that gun at me. Drop that pistol, I say. Drop it. She has no mind, Olaf. You are powerless before her. And her fingers on the trigger. No! No! <laughs> <laughs> now, Orla, you, like me, have paid your master's price. Only you bought power. Something evil had to sell. I tried to purchase love. <laughs> <laughs> Important business, Satan. Near a midnight, Satan. <laughs> That's going to do it for the horror this week. Hope you enjoyed it. You can find more from The Witch's Tale at relicradio.com. More from this podcast, all the other podcasts, and thousands of other old-time radio episodes, all available for free thanks to your donations. If you'd like to help support this and all of the shows, visit donate.relicradio.com. Click on the donate link while you're at the website. Thanks to those who have helped out. Thanks for joining me today. I'll be back next Saturday with a story from Suspense on another episode of The Horror. Presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked. Stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. Strange Tales. Thanks for joining me this Sunday. We're going to hear from Escape this week. The series had aired over CBS stations for 230 episodes between July of 1947 and September of 1954. Our story today is from November 16th, 1952. It's titled The Lou Guru. Tired of the everyday grind? 
Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are hiding, crouched waist deep in the murky waters of a Louisiana bayou, while closing in on you, coming towards you through the night, is a lusting mob screaming for your life. Listen now as Escape brings you William Frug's unusual story, The Lou Garou. Monsieur Legrand. It's going to be a hot day today. Uh, oui. You shrimp nets, Phil? Where is Marie? Marie? Uh, where is your daughter, Marie? Oh. He's delivering some medicine to Brother Coxie. He don't feel well today. You mean he's drunk? Uh. I wish to talk to you uh, about Marie. Yes, Gus? You have heard the village talk? No. I am worried for her. Worried? Why? Oh, she's been seen again on the levees with the stranger. Oh? I didn't know. Uh, There is bad talk about the stranger. What do they say? Oh, it is bad talk, Monsieur Legrand. Tell me, Gus. Tell me. They say the stranger has killed Pierre's baby. Pierre? Mm -hmm. Gus. I know the bayous, Monsieur. Strange things happen. But this thing, this thing is it. No, no, I don't believe it. It is not what you believe, but what the others believe. Oui. Oui, that is true. I have come to warn you. About my Marie? She is young and pretty and headstrong. I would not like to see her harmed. Now I have warned you, Monsieur Legrand. We cannot protect this stranger. But uh, Marie... Oui, 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 Gus, I... I will tell Marie. We wait here. Gus comes soon. Hey, what Gus want? I do not know. They say it is important. Mm. Ah, uh, the pilot. Well, that is life. No, not you, Taco. You smell too much like shrimp. What is wrong with the shrimp? Well, pilots smell like hair tonic. There's a big difference. My cousin is pilot. Mm. He go on the boat to New Orleans every month. Well, I've been New Orleans. Pilots smart fellows, Willie. They make big money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have plenty of women, I bet. Yeah, plenty of everything. Mm-hmm. To be a pilot. <laughs> that is a lot. Yeah. Oh, here come Gus. Oh. Bonjour. Hey, hello, uh, Gus. Hi, Gus. Uh, uh, where's the wine? <laughs> ah, mosquitoes. Here, I, I have some wine. Mm-hmm. Ah. Orange wine. It is good orange wine. I make it myself. Hey, will you drink this? I'm used to better. Hey, Taco, give it to me. I ain't so particular. Mm. Mm. I 
I just come from uh, Pierre's house. Uh, how is little Trapper? Oh, you're angry. Very angry. Well, what's the matter? Ain't he getting enough for his muskrat? His baby is dead. Dead? Oui. Oh, he got 11 more. Oh, I'm sorry for Pierre. He was swamp fever. Oh, do not be so sure. What do you mean, Gus? There are other ways for babies to die. What you getting at? Taco. Yes, Gus. You have seen the um, stranger? The tall one, quiet one. Oh, uh, we... Hey, I seen him. Walking down Levitt the other night with your gal, Marie. I warn you. Hey, uh, I have seen him, Gus. Girl's baby took sick the night the stranger come. Huh? Hey, oui, that is right. Uh, that was the, the same night I lose my car, remember? We all looked. I uh, remember well. The car just disappeared. The night the stranger come. Hey, the night he come, a uh, animal disappear. The baby gets sick. There is only one way this can happen. Oh, hey, I seen a ghost once in the swamp. This stranger, he live in the swamp. The animal disappear, baby die. Oh. What evil creature can do this, Taco? Eh? What evil creature? Look, Carol. Werewolf. Lugaru. Mm. Gus, what will we do? We are in danger. Well, we do one thing. We fix him before he fix us. There. Oh. Hello, Murray. You come to see me, no? I come to buy me some salt. <laughs> we have salt. Marie? Marie, we have a customer. Oh, you're here. Oui, Papa. It, it's Deb. Mm -hmm. Come to buy me some salt. Uh, Papa, Zeb's from Mississippi. It's hot there, too. Isn't it, Zeb? I don't mind it, none. You, uh, like the bayous, Mr. Zeb? I reckon. Bayous got strange ways. Zeb's gonna be a big farmer someday, Papa. He's learning to grow things in the swamps. In the swamps? <laughs> Here's your salt, Mr. Zeb. Good day. D Don't you want me to pay you? Just put your money on the counter. Thank you. Jim? Y yes, sir? Uh, we walk again on the living? Well, I... Can I? I, I reckon... Marie. Yes, Papa. I don't like this. But why, Papa? This Zeb. He's a stranger here. He don't understand the bayous. Then I teach him. There's talk. What kind of talk? Gus. He come to see me. Why don't you like Gus no more? I like Zeb. Gus is word for you. He says the village don't like Zeb. Oh, Gus is jealous. Well, there are others. They all say Zeb is evil. I don't believe it. Marie. Marie, honey, I know these people. I know the Delta. You got to promise me you won't see this Zeb again. <laughs> My 
baby's dead. I am sorry, Pierre. And you saw him near your cabin the night the child took sick. Did you not, Pierre? We uh, saw him with the girl, Marie, with the daughter of the storekeeper, I'm sure. He was with Marie. See, I thought that she no, was... No, never a... mind that. You saw the stranger, Pierre, huh? We. Oui. But there. Uh, what have I told you? Because she's right. Maybe we ought to ask Marie. No, she is a child. She does not know about these things. Yeah, but see how you and her... You oh, shut up! Oh. Marie! Marie is nothing to me. It, it, it is the stranger we must think of. Because she's right. Stranger? He's killed my baby. Oh, we waste no more time talking. Come. We get the others. That you, Zeb? Yeah. I can't see like you used to. Getting dark out. Yeah. It's uh, me, Brother Coxie. Now, ain't you going to ask me in? Yeah, come on in. Hey, nice, cozy place you got here. Thank you. Got any liquor? Reckon not. <laughs> Lucky I brought some. Want to pull? No, thank you. Excuse me, then. I, I come to, to talk to you, Zeb. Yeah? It's trouble, Zeb. Bad trouble. Been brewing a long time. Why are you telling me? Brother Cox is your friend. I come to warn you, son. I don't need no warning. Then you hear it? Reckon I did. What you gonna do? Ain't gonna do nothing. Yep. This ain't no ordinary trouble. The crops is bad. There ain't been no rain. The people are stirred up. This is my land. I aim to stay on it. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it. That's from the Bible, Old Testament. Proverbs. I... Don't care what the Bible says. This is my cabin. Zeb, they don't want your cabin. Then what do they want? Son, you listen to Brother Coxie. I come here 47 years ago. I come to do good and preach the word of the Lord. And I come with nothing but the shirt on my back and the good book in my hand. I can't read no book. There's good people here. But they got their ways. What kind of ways? They got their notions... Zeb, you ever heard of the Fou Follet? Nah, ain't never. Ain't nothing but swamp gas. Little pockets of gas that explode in the swamps. Folks down here figure that there's evil spirits. When they see them, they just naturally got to start running. Uh, uh, I've seen them. And it's the same way with the spirits. Ghosts, zombies. Uh, I've I never seen them. Folks in the bayous have. What's that got to do with me? You ever hear tell of a loup garou? No. Spirit that can change himself into an animal. What kind of animal? Any kind. Feels like horse, dog, cow, anything. Is there such a thing? Oh, yes, say it is. Loup garou kills people. Hope I don't ever see one. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. You got to believe in him first. I, I don't know. Suppose you was one of them. But... Me? Just fool. I don't know. That's why you got to leave this place. You, you talk crazy, Brother Coxie. You drunk? Maybe. You you better get. Zeb, folks is a saying that you're a Luguru. Brother Coxie, you better get. Zeb, listen to I, me. I ain't much for books. I, I, I'm i just a farmer. I come here for a place of my own. I don't like crazy talk. Son, this ain't crazy. Get. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's book talk again. Matthew said. Get. Just this once, Zeb. Just this once, listen to me. 
You're in terrible trouble. I can take care of myself. And I ain't moving off my land. Now you get it. We will return to Escape and tonight's story, The Lou Garou, in just a moment. Tomorrow night, don't miss William Holden as a hero beneath the seas in Lux Radio Theater's stirring adaptation of the screenplay Submarine Command. And now, back to Escape. I'm just closing the store. Never mind, store come at once. Where? The orange packing shed. There is big meeting tonight. What meeting? The village. All village. You must come. Why? The stranger. We get the stranger. He has killed Pierre's baby. We must save the village. Ah, go on without me. It is better you come. Hmm? Yeah. Maybe it is better I come. Hurry, Lisa. Papa, what is it? What did Taco say? Not for you. It's about Zeb? Yeah, Zeb. The village is against him? Yeah. What's he done to them? Well, he, he's a stranger. They're feared of him. There's more. Papa, tell me. Well, they... They, they all say he killed Pierre's baby. Papa. I don't believe him. Papa, you will help him. I'm only one boy. Then you must go at once. We. Oui. I'll try. Papa. Huh? Yes? Do you believe Zeb be evil? I don't know. He's not, Papa. I swear. You love Zeb? We. Oui. I love him. Then I trust what you say. Stop him. You must stop him. Yeah, him. I'll go. Now, there's danger here, Marie. You stay inside and lock the doors and windows. I'll go to there. No, no, Marie. You must not go there. I'll go to there. Marie. Marie. Come back. Come back. With this stove, my baby last day. There must be justice. Kill the Lugaru, that's justice. Oh, wait, no, stop. Stop. We, we hear all the evidence. Is there any other who wishes to speak? I wish to speak, Monsieur Goss. Huh? Oh, oh, Monsieur Legrand. I have lived in the bayous many years. This is my home. And I've seen things I can't explain. Strange little lights in the swamps, the animals who disappear without trace, and the men who suddenly die without reason. These things I can't explain. And I've seen the stranger who calls himself Zeb. And I say to myself, is this man evil? Or do I fear this man because he's a stranger? And the answer is yes. I love talking about The answer is yes. The answer is yes, I fear this man because I don't know him. And that's the only reason. Enough. 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 We have heard, Monsieur Legrand. There will be swamp justice. No, we do not kill. We tie the Lugaru to the stake and let the mosquitoes and the tapanos be the executioners. Yeah, that's right. Justice for the Lugaru! Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth this color in the cup, 
At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. <laughs> Proverb 23. You're drunk, Brother Coxie. Drunker than an alligator in an oyster bed. You better leave. Drunker than a drumfish in a shrimp net. You better go home. <sighs> Ain't you ever going to get some sense, boy? Home is where the bottle is. The bottle's empty. <laughs> so it is, so it is. Forty-seven years in the bayous and the bottle is always empty. You try, son. You try your almightiest and they just don't listen. You try and you pray that the wrath of God will show them and they just don't listen. Uh, <clears throat> well, 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 they're here. Your company's here, Sam. They can come. And open that door, boy, and you sign your death warrant. I can take care of myself. Sam! Sam! What are you doing here? Sam, let's go at once. I'm staying. Sam, they're coming to kill you. I got a gun. The whole village, Sam! In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You shut up! Sam, Gus is bringing the village to kill you. They say you're a... Lugaru. I don't know no Lugaru. It's not true, Zeb. I know it's not true. Maybe it is. You better get. I'll not leave without you. Maybe I'm what they say I am. I, I don't know. You're not, Zeb. It's Gus. He's made them this way. He's made them angry. You better get. I may hurt you like I hurt the others. Brother, help me. <laughs> Love is the strongest death. Jealousy is the greatest you. Dream. I plead with you. Leave before you kill. Leave for my sake. What? For your sake. For me, Zeb. For Marie. Zeb. Zeb. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Timothy, please. If... Uh, all right. All right, I'll go. Oh, quickly. In the swamp. They'll not see us in the darkness. If the blind lady blind bulls fall into the ditch, Matthew 14. I'm coming with you. This way. I'll uh, lead the way. I'm coming with you. Oh, we'll, we'll wait for Brother Cox. We can't wait, Zeb. Brother Cox. Where do you now go? I will go. I, but I think I'll nap you a little bit. Zeb, we can't wait. All right. Follow me. Zeb, I'm with you, Zeb. <laughs> oh, it's no use. Zeb, please. Come here. Maybe they're right. They're not right, Zeb. Hurry. We're gaining. Maybe I ought to give up, huh? They can't find it. It's wrong, Zeb. Hurry. Hurry. Huh? Hurry. <laughs> Marie. There's no man. You go without me. What? You cut your leg. Go without me, Zeb. It's your life. Oh, it's no use running now. Zeb, have your match. What? A match. Quickly. Here, Tommy. It's our only chance. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're not hurt. Papa. Gus is dead. I killed him. Gus came with a knife. He tried to kill them. Oh, I see. The others. They're gone? We. Oui. They've gone. Will they come looking for us? No. They fear the evil swamp spirit. Can we go back now, Papa? Yes. Gus was the evil spirit. And the Lou Guru is dead. Under the direction of Norman MacDonald, Escape has brought you The Lou Garou by William Frug, starring Bill Conrad with John Daner, Georgia Ellis, and Forrest Lewis. Featured in the cast were Tom Tully, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, and Don Diamond. Editorial supervision is by John Meston, and the special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. <laughs> You are standing alone and trembling in an ancient cathedral while outside somewhere in the night is the stranger who's been stalking you, seeking out your life. So listen next week when Escape brings you Kathleen Height's strange tale of adventure, Transport to Terror. <laughs> Agnes Moorhead, the first lady of suspense, makes her 19th starring appearance tomorrow night on CBS Radio Suspense. Don't miss Agnes Moorhead in Death and Miss Turner tomorrow night over most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for Robert Trout and the News, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Roy Rowan speaking, and remember, you're invited to Art Linkletter's house party every weekday on the CBS Radio Network. That's it for Strange Tales this week. Hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more from Escape, Relic, Radio, thousands of other old-time radio episodes, and our Shoutcast stream all at relicradio.com. You can donate through the website as well if you'd like to help support this and all of the show. We're advertising free on the website and the podcasts. That's how I like it. If that's how you like it and you're able to help out, give that donate button a click or visit donate.relicradio.com. Thank you, as always, to those who have helped out, and thanks for joining me today. Be back next week with another story from Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Strange Tales.